Hello, my name is Mighty Slim, and we're talking to the great Chuck Berghofer today. How are you doing, Chuck? I'm doing great. Yeah. Thank you so much. Excellent. So, uh, so tell us, uh, your was it your great grandfather that played with John Philip Sousa? Oh, how did you know that? My God, no, it was actually my grandfather, mm -hmm. and uh, I I never met him. He died when he was about 35. But he was with John Philip Sousa. He's from Tahiti originally, and they played cornet with John Philip Sousa. Mm -hmm. And then his his kids, my mother, and then her brother, uh, and then he was with St. Louis Symphony, played uh, tuba and string bass. And then his son John Babbage uh, played saxophone. Did the Tonight Show the whole time it was on, all that mm -hmm. stuff. So I came from a family of musicians. Sure. That, except for my father's side, they weren't. But my mother's side were all, all yeah, in the music business. Did you start off on trumpet? Started in the fifth grade or whatever, yeah, on trumpet. Played first trumpet. And then okay. I went to trombone, same thing. And worked my way down the food chain, I call it, to tuba. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then bar a string bass, and that was it. And that's the way it started. And then I... Once I started the string bass, I knew I, I loved it, mm. and um, so I, that, that was it. I stuck with that. And, uh, what were some of the first things you remember learning on string bass? Well, oh, I don't know. I was trying to copy stuff I'd just heard on record or something. Mm -hmm. and, uh, Leroy Vinegar was one of the first guys I'd heard play. My folks brought an album home that he was on, Shelly Mann, I think, and uh, anyway, yeah. And I, I heard that, and I thought, wow, that that's, intrigues me. That's what I want to do. Mm -hmm. I got to, uh, you know, I, I met him after that, of course, through the years and everything, and I got to tell him all that stuff. But, uh, yeah, he was my influence. And a lot of people were influenced by Ray Brown or all that. Paul Chambers was my favorite bass player later on mm -hmm. with Miles Davis. Sure. He just, the groove he got, just like, right down the middle. Mm. How, how, did, how did you feel your... Uh your early develop your your background, say in playing trumpet and, and, and trombone informed your bass playing? I don't know. I don't think it had much to do with it. Okay. <laughs> it was one of those things that the bass just felt natural to me. Uh, not that I was that good in the beginning. I heard some stuff I played on pretty awful but mm. and I, I only took a few lessons from a guy named Ralph Pena, who was a wonderful bass player. And uh, just not very many, but the ones that I did take in his garage uh, he had a group, Jim Hall was playing guitar, mm. and, and, and Jimmy Drewford was playing. And so they'd come over there sometimes when I'm finishing my lesson to play, and, and I'd stick around and listen to them. And a couple of times after that, they let me play a tune with them, that kind of thing. Wow, you know? amazing. And uh, they just kind of started off slow, but got very lucky. I, I graduated high school in 1955 went on the road with a big band right out of high school, Skinny Ennis' band, mm -hmm. and met some great players. A piano player, Fred Otis, was on the band. He taught me. We played a lot together, just just learning by playing. Mm -hmm. you know? Very lucky. Did that. Then by 1957, I get a call to go with Peggy Lee, and I, I went with her, with Stan Levy and Lou Levy. And I uh, roomed with Stan Levy, actually. It was, it, it, he was a great wonderful person, great drummer. So all those things really led, led me up. You know, I couldn't, I don't know, I, I, I don't think that could happen today. You know, I, I never even knew any of these people and they're calling me and I don't know how they got to know my name or sure. anything. And then, then it, it just, it was that way for, you know, from the beginning and kept uh, falling into other things. All, all of a sudden Shelly Mann called me. I'm opening a new club called Shelly's Mann Hall. Mm -hmm. Then I, by then I was 22 years old, and, and uh, would you be interested? I was sure. So I go down there, and you know I knew it was an audition, but you know I played. I played about three tones. And he turned around and said, "You got the gig." Mm -hmm. So it was Russ Freeman and uh, Shelley, myself in the rhythm section, uh, uh, Count Condole playing trumpet. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it was just an amazing band. And, uh, so I stuck it, stuck it out there for about three, four years. I was uh, told you had you had uh, 
different people would come and sit in? Yeah, oh, well, definitely. Well, uh, actually, one night, Shelley had, uh, oh, God, uh, uh, here I am with my memory, you know, uh-huh. 80, well, almost 80, <laughs> yeah. you know. Uh, Philly Joe Jones, mm-hmm. he, he hired him to sub for him one night, and I was I I, I was in the Miles Davis so much then it's like, holy God, I can't mm-hmm. believe that you know. And so we, we played the first set, and this is before amplifiers or any gut strings we had, you know, playing. Mm-hmm. Hard. Mm-hmm. And uh, we get off the first set, and Philly Joe comes up and says, "I can make a bass player out of you." <laughs> you <know. laughs> You don't have to play so hard. You, know, you can just kind of cool a little bit. Just, mm-hmm. you know, just, so I went back and did that, and it opened up a. The bass sounded better. Everything did. I, I mean, just that one thing I learned. You know, take people years to figure mm-hmm. that out. I guess, but from coming from him, oh, okay. You know, Philly Joe Jones. So that was a big step forward. Mm-hmm. Made sixteen dollars a night there, and. And actually, in those days, you could actually buy food and do mm-hmm. stuff. You know, I had a nice little apartment for apartment, a house with yeah. with everything for 125 a month. Or something. I did other gigs too during the week. You know, whatever, just casuals, but nothing paid. You know, back in those days, the first house I bought was twenty eight thousand dollars or something. Second one was forty thousand. Know, things were different than they are now. Sure. <laughs> So went on with that, with that, and then Howard Roberts, the guitar player. Sure, I wound up doing all of his albums actually, but that's what turned me on. You know, I, I did these albums and uh, they were great. And I met Jack Marshall, who was one of his close friends, who was writing for the Munsters at Universal, mm-hmm. and that got me into Universal. I started playing on that straw, and then that's sort of how I got into the studio stuff. You know. And did you play on the Monsters theme? Yeah, all that stuff. Okay. The Monsters. You and did the theme and the and the, uh, the, and the, the music. show itself. Yeah, yeah, yeah the, the music and yeah. 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 And uh, after that, I mean, I mean, I've done I don't know. Well, it goes on and on. Uh, many movies, uh, you know, all that stuff. Yeah. What would you say some of your uh, favorite soundtracks that you were on? Oh gosh. Well, I, I did almost all of Dave Grusin's movies. Mm-hmm. And he was my, my favorite writer, uh, unbelievable, just great. So I, I, I can't even remember the names of all of them. But sure. But those are, those are some of my favorite ones. And, uh, yeah. Some of them I can't even remember the names of anymore. anymore. Sure. I, there, I have a list that, that you know I get a. We still get paid for all the even some of the old stuff that's out. You know whatever comes up in July, you get a whole list of this stuff. It sure. goes on and on and on. Oh, I forgot I did that movie, you know, that list of them. But, uh, yeah, anyway, that was, it was a great period of time. Everybody was working. It actually turned down as much as you took. Interesting, yeah. Totally different now. Now, I mean, there, there was live, first of all, there was live music on every single thing. And we used to go to, to a little uh, room once in a while over at what we call United Records. I think it's called United again. Actually, this was called Western. It's down the street from there. That's another place. Anyway, we go into the back studio and they play a synthesizer. This is a new thing, a synthesizer. Mm-hmm. Here's a French horn. Mm-hmm. Here's a, you know, we thought, oh, forget it. That's, you know, so we didn't worry about that. Then. But then gradually that started to, you know, synthesizer player be on a date. It would take up an enormous amount of room with all these equipment in there and do all the weird sounds and this and that. And that's it gradually started but finally they got to the point where they, they could make it sound like an orchestra. Mm. It took years but that's what wiped out the, the live music thing. I mean they still use live music thank God for right. a lot of movies and that's you know but uh, that's because of the guys that, that John Williams for instance I I, I think he kept it going much longer than it would have. Mm-hmm. And now I work with Seth MacFarlane all the time, and he insists on big orchestra. Mm. So he's another one that's keeping that going. But great. That's great. Yeah. yeah he's, he's the greatest. Another, yeah. Yeah, he really helped me a lot, too. 
I mean, but when I say helped me, uh, kept me working. Kept you going that way. <laughs> kept me working. Kept you going. Know. Sure. Yeah. The uh, speaking of, of uh, recordings with orchestras, uh, what do you remember about uh, Pet Sounds? Yeah. Well, I, 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 how do you know that? Yeah, I, I worked with them. I try to do my own work. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> I, I didn't even re I forgot that I even did any of it because it all ran together after a while. Sure. But, oh, oh, yeah, I just did, you know, that went, you know. And then somebody came up with an album of Pet Sounds. Can you sign this? What do you mean? I turn it over and I see my name on it. Oh, yeah, okay. Because, uh, I, I don't know, it was all ran together. I did all of the months, not the, no, I mean, in, in, in that thing, not, not, not the monster, that's another thing. Yeah. But I, I did other, so many different artists. Uh, the Monkees, you know, yeah. all that. Sure. Do you remember working with Love? Uh, not really. Okay. okay. <laughs> Probably, it, it, it's just an, another date, and then I go to Dante's and play jazz, because mm -hmm. the rest of I'm just going boom, 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 <laughs> and, you know. And Carol Cabin's on a lot of, we, we're doubling the bass lines, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, I I love the money. I can't say I love the music, you know. Okay, sure. But then I felt started filling some other stuff with Sinatra and different things. And wow, that's nice. And that, that's what I loved anyway. Is a straight ahead music, straight ahead jazz or big bands and things like that. Sure. But at Dante's, I play, you know, play with everybody. Got it. There's a great thing out now that you can still watch with Zoot Sims. It was done back, God, way back. Larry Bunker, Roger Calloway, and myself and Zoo. Mm. And we, we all have beads on and, you know. The chops. <laughs> the, the, yeah. You know, whatever we're looking like, yeah. the, the hippie yeah. period of time. Zoot's in a beautiful suit, you know, <laughs> from New York, you know. And uh, sounding absolutely incredible. But you can still find that. Just look up Dante's, Zoot Sims at Dante's, mm -hmm. and it comes up. You know. People still talk. It's got, it kind of got popular now. I hear people talking about, it. "Oh, we, we saw you on that." You know, you wouldn't recognize me now. Mm -hmm. Young guy. When did when did you switch to uh, to electric? That was during this. Let me see, the seventies. Yeah, I started playing a lot of electric, and, and I and I did quite a quite a bit of that. In fact, I got to the point where they'd ask me to do it on string bass or something about string bass no I can do it it's fine this way so I went out with Steve Needy you know mm -hmm. sure and, and I played electric that's, they used electric after that the whole time but on this thing it was straight ahead big band stuff and I took my electric and it was great and I, and I, I loved playing it it was fun and uh, uh, did you know, I did a big famous uh, Barney Miller thing that sure. turned out to be one of the things. Uh, I did. It's a bass line I learned as a kid. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> so what do you remember? What do you remember about that? Just another day. Uh, I was doing Carol Burnett's show, yep. and we had a three-hour lunch break on Thursdays, and I went up and did a pilot, which for, for this for, for that show for Barney Miller. Yeah, Barney Miller. Then Jack Elliott and Alan Ferguson had a whole other thing written and everything, and we played that. And the guy comes out of the booth and says, you know, is there any chance we can just make it simple? I mean, maybe, maybe just start with the bass. This guy's a cop in New York and blah, blah, blah. So I played that lick. That's it. And so that became the theme. Then they put a bridge to it, went up, you know, and that was it. You know, and, uh, and so you came, you came up with a line. It wasn't a, yeah. it wasn't a written line. Oh, yeah, right? yeah. But, but sure. I mean, they, they you know. I never got credit for it or anything, mm -hmm. but uh, I mean, everybody knew that I did it, but they called me for every job they did after that. But, mm -hmm. You know, had I, I, that was, I would have made a lot of money if I had that, if that was my theme song, because it was a big popular show. Sure. But I still made, did fine, it got me, and I, I finally figured out, I wouldn't have been there in the first place if it wasn't for them, so. Right. I was, you know, able to, that, that made me jump up a bit, I'll put it that way, so that was good. How much of that theme do you remember as being as being edited? You know, when when they have the theme, it's obviously yeah on the on the show. It's it's you know, not really forty seconds long or yeah. Well, yeah. some of that yeah, yeah, some of that. But it, it, uh, um, I no, I understand what you mean on yeah. that. The the bridge they put in the you know went up to A flat and did a thing. Yeah. I just played boom, put it on, yeah. put it on, yeah. and 
you know, other than that. And then I and then I did another thing with them that was sort of a base feature, and they said, well, we're going to give you credit for them, but the show never went. <laughs> Trying to make it up, I guess, or something. Anyway. Chuck Rainey told me he did, that you did the theme, and then Chuck did some of the inc incidental music in the show. I don't know. Yeah. I, don't, I didn't even know that. But uh, They just wanted you on the theme, and, I don't and know. Maybe, maybe Chuck got the call. and Could be, or I couldn't mm -hmm. make it, or who knows what. I, sure. I, I don't know. Yeah. I, that's a good, but, you know, you, you, that's something I never knew about. You, mm -hmm. you can probably tell me more about me than I can. <laughs> <laughs> what, do you remember, what do you remember about uh, joining Elvis in 68? Oh, my God. Well, I know I, I went in the studio. We, uh, we did this comeback thing uh, at NBC. <clears throat> but we were in the studio playing, you know, and... Uh, here I am playing with Elvis and all this, and he was the nicest. Mm -hmm. I mean, it wasn't it wasn't being a whatever a big shot or anything. Sure. Just kind of one of us. Mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah, that was fun, and and it was like later on uh, if, uh, after I mean uh, after that after I did a that show and then I played with them a little bit on that. Uh, well, after that, I, I was. I forget where I was, but I all of a sudden get a call to go on the road with all this. Mm -hmm. And that's when I, I thought, that means, once again, I'm busy in the studios. Right. So I, I and, and that wasn't my bag anyway. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was a jazz player. Sure. And so I turned that down, which is probably the best thing that happened because otherwise I would, uh, you know, I stayed in the studio thing until all that stuff is about ended. So. Sure, that's what that's what uh, yeah. Jerry Jamon told me. Yeah. He said uh, Aretha wanted him, King Curtis wanted him, and he said I wanted to stay in New York and, do, and continue to do sessions. Yeah, yep. because it's different kinds of music. You stay at home, you make good money, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, probably not as much as you know. I'm not, I'm not sure what it even paid by Elvis on the road back then. But I'm sure, it was fine, but uh, I don't know. Do you, remember, do you remember what the re rehearsals were like? Well, I, I didn't really get into doing that mm -hmm. uh, because I didn't go out, all, out with them. But, uh, no, the rehearsals for the 68 comeback special. Oh, yeah. Well, it was just like any other rehearsal. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I, you know I, yeah. For doing this tune and, yeah. Yeah. I, I can't remember much about all that. Mm -hmm. It was just, uh, you know, I, I, every day, three dates a day, I think, for a while I was doing it. So they were all run together. Mm -hmm. What do you remember about. Uh, Working with uh, Frank Zappa on the uh, Lumpy Grave. <laughs> well, one of the things that happened. We're big Zappa fans. So just one you know of the that. things that happened with that is that uh, the bass that I used on that, uh, Bob Bang let me borrow. And, and it was a Fender, uh, 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 what did they call it? It was the regular, uh, I can't remember the name of it. <laughs> but it was an old Fender bass, and it had, and it had a, I remember it had like a serial number of like 22 or something, mm -hmm. you know, like one of the very first ones they made. Sure. You know? And it sounded great. I always wanted it, you know, after that I said, Jesus, I got this bass, and it sounded really, really cool. And he couldn't, he, he didn't, wouldn't get rid of it or something. And then, anyway, somebody else bought it, a big time guy, I can't even remember who it was. Huh? So I, I never got that bass, but that's what I remember doing those gigs. And that, they were not easy. Mm -hmm. It was really out there, you know, and, and quite a lot of reading and doing this and that. But uh, I didn't realize until much later on that what a big deal that was. Mm -hmm. you know, just all of a sudden on another gig, you know. Sure, another day. Who the hell is this guy? You know, <laughs> what are those so, but to, to, to see people that take off, you know, pretty amazing. So just another date. Somebody, Frank called you up, or well, um, somebody that was working in the studio. That yeah, Frank yeah, was yeah, called I'm, you up. I'm trying to remember who yeah. who the contractor even yeah. was then. But, uh, yeah, I, I just showed up. In fact, it was a capital too. That was one of the uh, way back before the it is the way it is now. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. And it was, yeah, lumpy gravy. Oh my God, you're on that. You know, <laughs> I am. You know, okay. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's great. Well, uh, 
you work you work with Art Blakey? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I don't remember. You don't remember. Did you have me down for that? Yes, I have you down with working with Art Blakey. Yeah. Maybe I did. Yeah. I'm, I'm trying to think. Yeah. Um, it's, it's very possible. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't remember. I don't remember that. Unless of where it was or how. You know. I don't know. Sure. That's a good one. In, in your opinion, uh, favorite drummers you worked with, and and uh, what, in your opinion, makes a great drummer? Okay. Well. Of course, I go back to Shelley Mann, yep. one of my favorite, and, and favorite people, too, mm -hmm. by the way. Just an incredible person. And, uh, yeah, he, he was one of my favorites. I, I, the many guys, right, right now, well, I mean, it goes on and on. Actually, drummers, I shouldn't say that because a lot of them weren't that good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but the, the few that stand out, you know, uh, well, Shelley, of course. Mm -hmm. but, uh, uh, and then I played with with Pete Jolly Trio for 40 years, mm -hmm. and, and Nick Martinez, who no one knows who that is, probably played, and he was wonderful. At the time. We called him, he, he was from Philadelphia, we called him Philly Joe Nick. Now, right now, the guy that I I, I shouldn't be saying that, so I'll have all the drummers pissed off at me. They understand. <laughs> Why did you mention me? Right? Peter Erskine is my favorite drummer. We, we play together a lot. Okay. And, uh, you know, he's you know, right on. Mm. I love him. Um, when you work with singers, um, how do you feel your because I know you've done a lot of you work with a lot of singers, and and how would you say your approach to the uh, the bass changes or not? Working, working with a singer. Well, just and, and maybe a duet form or. Well, that way, but, but uh, you know, I have worked with God, many, many. Mm -hmm. I did Rosemary Clooney and the Seven Elms or there or something. Mm -hmm. uh, just whatever the music is, right there, what, and, and it doesn't change anything you play. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, you play whatever it, it really requires, but sure. Uh, different styles. Um, Michael Blue Blame worked with him. Great, really talented. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, Sinatra. I mean, you get spoiled right there. Mm -hmm. well, you know, who else? I don't know who's any better than that. I'm sure. sure. But, uh, but uh, right now, uh, it's uh, the guy I'm working with all the time is, uh, you know, uh, is, is making me uh, really. Uh, well, he bought the, the, the entire Sinatra library. And is owns it now, mm -hmm. and we're recording all his stuff, you know, uh, a little bit at a time. And then he's going to put the whole thing in, into uh, uh, Smithsonian Institute. That's all right. And, uh, that's, oh, Seth MacFarlane. I, I didn't mention sure. the name this yeah. time. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. But that's who I'm working with now. Mm -hmm. uh, and he's he's a family family yeah. guy and whatnot. Yeah, yep. so I do family guy and mm -hmm. all that stuff. You know, thank God that, that keeps me going. So, as as your skills improved on bass, how do you feel that? How do you feel that that informed your non-playing life? Oh well, gosh, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, the two different separate things. When I'm playing the bass, my age disappears. Everything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you go into a place and you can't get to it some other way. I don't know. It's a weird thing. Sure. Uh, maybe people do it through meditation or something. I'm not sure. But yeah. That takes my... While I'm playing the bass, it's, I'm back in the, just another world. Time, a timeless it's zone. A timeless yeah. zone. Yeah. yeah, I really am. That's why guys play till they're 95. And sure. All this stuff, you know. Well, do that and other things. You can't be a golfer or athlete or thing. You know, all kinds of things. Music, you can. So, what can you tell me about the uh, most one of the most famous sessions you worked on? These boots are made for walking. And now, was you and Carol Kay on that, or? Yeah. Well, we just didn't ever do the same. This was the last tune. They weren't even going to do this thing. You know? mm -hmm. and, uh, she, can't remember who. Uh, uh, oh God, I can't think of the guy's name. That was producing the whole thing. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, God. Anyway, they were battling over whether or not to do this tune. So anyway, it starts out, you know, and, and uh, uh, Billy Strange was the 
the writer. <laughs> I mean, he had a different kind of a thing written. Um, and so, I, anyway, I, I tried a couple of times on that, and it didn't quite, so I made it my own thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've got, I was upstairs somewhere, I've got somebody getting a, that was on the date, he was he was a assistant engineer, gave me a copy of seven, you know, take one through seven, mm -hmm. and then I start off, and you can hear the difference. All of a sudden it just falls into that thing, and, and that turned out to be the biggest hit, you know, a big deal. And so, between those, you know, my two big hits, yeah. Barmy Moe and, yeah. and <laughs> that was first, of course. Were the, were the previous takes having you doing the uh, sort of descending, descending yeah, baseline? It, it was, yeah, yeah, it was his uh, Billy Trainer's idea, mm -hmm. but, but it was a little bit different. The 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 or something. Um, I got you. Yeah. Yep. yeah. And, uh, so I just finally stretched it out to that one thing, and and you know that's weird. They just have to, that was the front, the leak on the whole tune. You mm -hmm. know, that just lucky to be there again at that point. But, sure. Uh, who knows? Wasn't anything I did special, believe me. But it, every every time they, they they went out on the road or something, nobody can play that kind of way. Yeah. You know that kind of. That, that, that's what they tell me when when you try to do it. A yeah. Famous bass player in, in uh, Sausalito said, "You ever try to play that? You can't really play it on an electric bass walking down chromatically." No, you can't. Yeah. 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 That's one thing you can't. You have yeah. to have a fretless if yeah. you're going to do that. You're right. <laughs> what kept you going in? Uh, in dark times, or what does keep you going? I don't know. Well, I, I, I've never had real dark times. Okay. Yeah. Um, that way. I mean, I've been through, you know, I, I'm, my life has really been pretty much, uh, I haven't had some real awful things. I mean, I've had some health issues a lot of the time older, but yep. they've been, but, but, you know, they're being taken care of and mm -hmm. okay. Sure. What, what would you say is the most important piece of uh, musical wisdom you learn? Wow. Well, <laughs> as, a, as a seasoned as a seasoned yeah, professional, I yeah. understand. Yeah. Well, I am. Except that I don't. Uh, I keep telling people, you know, I, I couldn't even write the chords of the blues out. Yeah. <laughs> so it's all just playing mm -hmm. and, and the instrument you play and all this. But for bass, to me. I was just able to, I always had been able to get a good sound playing tune, and, and time was the most important thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's a God given thing. I, 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 you can't teach somebody that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you can listen to a click track and try to play with it or something, sure. but you can't teach the, the groove. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was just lucky to have that built in, and so it was always easy. I and mean, that's what got me through everything. It was pitch and the sound, you know, get and, uh, no, and, and it was easy. It, it wasn't something I had to study to learn. Sure. You know, and so I never really studied, you know. I, you had to learn how to read, though, right? I did that on the gig. Mm -hmm. You know, I, Joe Mondragon, who I bought this bass and sitting over there from. Is, so he was uh, a bass player on uh, Fever by Peggy Lee. Yeah. yeah. And, and uh, he took me under his wing and said, you know, uh, Show me how to hold the bow and all that kind of mm. shit, and just one one thing at a time like that. And yeah, so with, with this bass, in fact, through the years, I borrowed it once when I was playing with Pete Jolly at uh, the club because mine was in the shop. Mm. I said, "Well, if you ever want to sell this, let me know." And that was like way back, you know, thirty years later. Yeah, he decided to sell it, and I bought it from him. And after that, his line was, "I sold you the bass, and the work went with it." <laughs> <laughs> I've got these two, this bass over there is on one of his too, but uh, this is the one that was on Fever and all those, those records. Wow. That's the bass, huh? Yeah. Amazing. Wow. <laughs> and, what, what, and, and finally, Chuck, what advice would you give to up-and-coming musicians? Whew. Frank no. Zappa said, don't do it, become a doctor instead. Uh, well, <laughs> almost, only because of... Where the music business is gone, right? Um, I mean, there's still going to be music, like if you can call it that, I yeah, guess. Right. Sure. Uh, but uh, God, uh, you know, people in symphony orchestras, I understand that they'll they'll be fine. Yeah. Doing it, you know, but but that's that that's a very different bag too. Sure. Uh, I know people that are in that. And they go, that's a, 
they're the only ones I know that sell their instruments after they get out, you know. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, I think I would just say, if you enjoy doing it, keep doing it. Mm -hmm. But uh, that, that's all you can do. Uh, uh, the business isn't the same anymore. Sure. So. Yeah, it's just not the same. Maybe it'll come back around. I don't know. Who knows? But it's not because I mean we played real music through most of those years. Sure. I mean, God, really gorgeous stuff, and, and now it's all just real uh, sample, simple, one. yeah, nothing. You know. Well, that's what's happening. I'm glad. I, I'm glad I was here during that time. And, you know. and, and so were we. <laughs> <laughs> All right, on that note, Chuck, thanks for talking hey, well, with us. It was a pleasure. Thank you for reminding me all this. <laughs> I, 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 I have used that all that, you know. That's great. All right, we'll see you when the future gets here. All right, thank, thank you. you so much.